Hello and welcome everybody to episode 5 of the Racing with Rob and Roller podcast. I'm Rob Peters and as always I am joined by Josh Roller. Hi. We have a number of topics to discuss today after a double feature at Iowa Speedway in one of the Triple Crowns of Motorsport, the 87th 24 Hours of Le Mans. We will also preview weekend's races, this weekend's races at Road America, Sonoma Raceway, Gateway, and Circuit Paul Ricard. Uh, so before we get started, make sure you follow us on Twitter. My name is Rob Peters, and my Twitter handle is at R-P-E-E-T-E-R-S-3-3. And alongside me, you have to also follow Josh as well. Uh, that's that's the rule. That's the rule. Um, if you follow me, you got to follow Josh. If you follow Josh, you got to follow me. That's the rules. I don't make them. I just follow them. Um, and he is located at... Uh, roller underscore zero one R O L L E R underscore zero one. So before before we get started, uh, we had a great Father's Day weekend. Yeah. I hope. Yeah, we did. We did a good, good weekend. Yeah. Rainy uh, though, unfortunately, and, and for for parts of the country, unfortunately. So and people in Iowa though, that was a good Father's Day out there. For they 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 uh, had two races on Father's Day. That was good. And yeah, that'd be a fun thing to do for your father. So how was your Father's Day though, Josh? It was you- good. Yeah. Uh, um, I was spent watching a little from races though. Dad was understanding of that. Had a good dinner. Uh, was gonna go up to uh, my grandpa, uh, my dad's dad, uh, but uh, we decided we're gonna do that this week instead. So it's gonna be good. It was a good, good day though. It's always good to spend time with parents, particularly as we get to our age and we move out. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. How was yours? Mine was mine was pretty good. Uh, I'm gonna see my father uh, tomorrow actually. So. Um, hopefully I'll be able to make up not seeing him on Father's Day, but I'll, I'll still see him on, on, on tomorrow, so I will be good. Oh, yeah. Hopefully he's not too mad at me about that. I did give him a call, though. That's good. So at least I you called him. him. Call him. You didn't text, you called No, him. I called him. I gave him a good call. That's a, that's a good, uh, whatever generation our parents are move. I'm not, I'm not sure what generation they, they are. I can't read them. Gen straight. Xers? Gen, no. Gen, I think they're, well, I think they're Gen X. Gen Xers? Yeah, something like that. Something like that. Anyway, uh, we have, we have a lot to talk about today on today's show. Uh, so the first thing we're going to go ahead and get started on is the Arca Shore Lunch 200 at Madison, uh, and I was able to catch that because I finally bit the bullet and got Fubo TV, which does include Mav TV. Uh, thankfully, I was I've been frustrated with Direct TV now for a while, but with my bill keep going up and them not giving me Mav TV like I keep asking them, uh, and then I find out this week or this past week that AT and T might is is going to get rid of it now. They're going to merge it into something else. Oh, and I, they, so I was like, okay, well, I've got nothing else to do. I gotta find something else. So it was a good thing because I was able to take the free trial and 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 take a look at uh, one of my first live Arca races on Mav TV. Uh, so the first thing that happened, we'll talk about. Uh, Chandler Smith won the race after holding off Michael Self after a late weight race restart. If I could talk today, uh, Ty Gibbs. The uh, grandson of Joe Gibbs mm-hmm. led 14 laps, but finished a disappointing eighth place. He was the last car on the lead lap. Haley Deegan was in the race, and she ran in the top 10 most of the day, but struggled to run up front until her engine let go with a little under, a little over 10 laps to go in the race. Now we talked about this last week or and weeks prior, yeah. but 18 cars entered the race and aren't in this race. 15 cars finished, and only eight were on the lead lap. But I found the race to be overall pretty entertaining because, you know, it is a short track, and short tracks tend to produce much much more entertaining races than, you know, a, a big oval would, especially with a low car count like that. Yeah, absolutely. But, you know, we, we bring this up, and, and Josh, you, you mentioned this, you know, kind of in, the, in, the, in our pre-show notes, too, is, you know, something, something is going on here in that we can't get... Uh, full fields for ARCA. We can't even get 20 cars to come out for one of these short tracks, which should be the cheaper ones to run. Yep. They're in the Midwest. They're where, you know, most of these teams are based. Mm-hmm. It's it's very strange that, um, you know, you only saw 18 cars show up and, and really only about five or six of them were really even competitive most of the race. Uh, in fact, you know, I saw cars getting lapped within the first two laps, which, you know, is, is kind of on par for a... Uh, it's kind of on par, you know, for an ARCA race, but I don't think that's what fans want to see. No. I don't think that's what you want to see if you're like me and now ending up paying five extra dollars a month just to get Mav TV just to watch cars go a lap down in the first two week, two laps of the, the event. So, you know, I, and I know you didn't see it, but I just, I was just kind of curious on, on what, what are your thoughts on, on, on ARCA and having this problem where we can't seem to 
get a decently sized field. Well, I, I don't know. I don't know what it is because we didn't really ha- have this problem in the past few years. Um, they only had two races last year that were sub twenty car fields, and this year we've had multiple multiple ones and three in a row now uh, at eighteen cars. And so Michigan, I'm like, okay, that's that's a two mile track, high speeds. You know, maybe there's people thinking. I don't want to take to spend the money there to either wreck or develop the car because we, I mean, we know we won't be competitive. But this is a short track. Come on, we should be seeing 25 cars out there. Um, it makes me wonder if, you know, with this NASCAR uh, purchasing ARCA, if there's been some mindset changes within that garage. Uh, not necessarily the culture has changed because I think ARCA wants to remain ARCA and I think maybe NASCAR would like it to. But I'm thinking that it's going down the road of... We're going to see basically a K&N Midwest, but it will be known as maybe the, the ARCA Pro Series, and it will essentially serve as that, per- that, that purpose uh, for all intents and purposes. So um, it, it, it worries me, but, it, you know, yeah, ARCA has been losing its flair in this, in this century compared to what it was and, uh, you know, in the previous these first 50 years of existence. So... Um, I, I, I like to say I'm not surprised, or I, I'm surprised, but I'm actually not surprised, unfortunately. Yeah, I think that's the thing. I love short track racing. I love watching, you know, short track series, and I love watching ARCA because of all the, just how different all the tracks they go to are. I feel oh, yeah, like absolutely. I wish that, you know, more more racing series took a page out of ARCA's book where it's like, yeah, let's be as diverse as possible. Let's run on every possible surface let's run on all the types of racetracks you know you know they go as big as talladega 2.66 miles you know to something as small as you know columbus or toledo or something like that columbus isn't even around anymore i think i don't think but you know and then they go on dirt and then they go they used to go on a road course i don't think they, they go, do they anymore. go on a mild dirt track mind you yes and, and that that's what's cool that's what our, our, like you said, it's diverse, and, and that's what really made the ARCA series so unique, but I think it's that the role that ARCA once filled has shifted and maybe been split even between the 2K&N series and NASCAR in the truck series. Yeah, and, definitely and, the truck series has played a big part in that, I think. And we see exit of big teams. I mean, mm-hmm. you look, you have, G, like in this, this, this particular this particular race, you had uh, the Venturinis fielded, I, I believe, four cars, you had GMS with the car there, and those, and Gibbs with a car. Um, so, and then you had the the twenty seven and the seventy seven and the twenty two. Those are usually pretty decent competitive cars. Um, you have venture any cars, basically, yeah. 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 So, you know, if we had more, I think we touched on this a week, and we won't we won't harp on it. But if you had some more. Even some truck teams that were fueling their youngsters up to maybe they're thinking about bringing them up next year, or Xfinity teams. You maybe see like a JRM mm. get get in there, or or you know like a Brandon built Motorsports or right. Jeremy Clements and this family field car. You know, looking up, hey, we're looking to expand, or we're wanting to help field the, the next generation of car. Um, it's right. surprising because you know they do run those composite bodies, and mm-hmm. you would think that those would be a lot cheaper. That would be a lot a bigger. Uh, uh, much more of a an incentive for teams, but unfortunately, it's not. And, and speaking of composite bodies, we're going to move on here real quick to the NASCAR Xfinity Series race um, because it was the Circuit City 250 at Iowa Speedway. Yeah, I guess Circuit City still exists. I listened actually on the MRN broadcast briefly. Uh, I had to to go out during the race for a brief moment of time, and I was listening to the MRN broadcast, and they actually had the Whoever is now in charge of Circuit City or CEO or whoever did the starting command, they brought him up in the booth. And honestly, I, I it sounded like this guy is just... You it's know, an online retailer. It's man. an online retailer, yeah. but it, it definitely sounded illegitimate. There were parts <laughs> of it, of the interview, that made me think that this is just one giant investment scheme for someone to try it who's obsessed with Circuit City, the Circuit City brand. I, I don't know. But anyway, so Christopher Bell dominated the race uh, on Sunday, leading 186 laps. Uh, it he uh, he won both stages, and Cole Custer finished second in the race. In 
while also finishing second in both stages as well. It was really much just a Christopher Bell versus Cole Custer. Yeah, I mean it, the whole it, time it was it was it was a Christopher Bell uh, leading Cole Custer for most right. of the race. Cole Custer had a good run and beginning of the first stage led the first 50 some laps and he lapped a bunch of cars um but once cole uh, christopher bell excuse me got around cole custer um it was lights out it, oh it, absolutely. Was, it was a sea bell show and that seems to be kind of very much par for the course because uh that is joe gibbs has now won five of the last seven races at iowa and they have five of the last nine nascar Xfinity series Short track wins. All with Christopher Bell. All, All with, with Christopher, Christopher Bell. Bell. Man. He, he's 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 pretty. He, I like to say it's his dirt track experience, but I really uh, I just think he, he's he's got these short tracks on these asphalt. Oh, he's down. so 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 good. Yeah. Um, not a lot of lead lap cars thanks to Cole Custer's blistering start in the first fifty laps of the race. He put a lot of cars a lap down. There's only twenty four cars left, I believe, after at the end of stage one. Now there's only thirty cars to start the race, but he just was lapping and lapping and lapping them and. And then uh, at one point we only got down to 12, 11, excuse me, lead lap cars. And then there was a caution, and, and Clements got the free pass. So uh, again, it was a, it was a fast fast race for the leaders up front. Yeah, there was, and there was uh, even some more contenders there. I, I don't think any of them, nobody was going to catch Christopher Bell or even Cole Custer today, but uh, that day. But uh, Tyler Reddick had tire issues, that spoiled his day. Noah Gregson as well. Uh, he was right there. Top um, streak for. Tyler Reddick came to an end, and and that was just you know that kind of stuff for him. But Noah Gregson really rebounded on that one. Oh, absolutely! Not lucky they were kind of racing. He was two laps down. He was still uh, yeah. two laps down. They were kind of racing for that you know the, those lucky dogs and lucky dog positions. And Noah Gregson got the lucky dog, able to take tires, and he drove up to six there in, mm-hmm. in the last run of the race. So um, what looked to be a really bad day for the nine team and and you know what was kind of turning into an okay run for that yeah, nine he was passing that, lots of cars early yeah. on in that race and and once he had the the tire issue it was just like oh my gosh is he even going to be able to get back in this yeah they, they uh definitely a vibration bent some uh the uh, spindles there so he wasn't able to get the, the lug nuts on properly so the this is the fact that he finished the race is kind oh of yeah a testament to that team and in his, in his driving ability H2 Motorsports and Shane Lee finish 18th, two laps down in debut after 14 cars drop out due to issues. Was that that was a Cir- Circuit City car, wasn't it? Yeah, it was a Circuit City was, car. Oh and, they're, and they're going to be racing uh, every race for the rest of the year. That's the plan, anyways. And I believe with Circuit City sponsorship. With Circuit City sponsor, man, yeah. I, I will promise you, this is not 2007. No, the, 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 and the great thing about this race too is that there was mid, there was mid pack racing. We, you know, we we've spoken here a couple mm-hmm. times now. You know, Bell got away. Custer was up there, but there was three wide racing, four wide a couple of times there. Oh, it was excellent. Um, traffic. I like it when traffic plays a role a little bit sometimes too, and guys are able to you know use them as a pick. And um, but there was three wide. I mean, Nemechek, Haley, uh, and I believe it was uh, oh Zane Smith. I believe got all three wide one time. And I was just like, this is crazy. And that's what I love about Iowa. The preferred line through the corners is kind of the middle. Mm-hmm. But when you want to make a pass, you dive down in, in into turn one or turn three, and you try to do a slide job up, make it stick. And Haley had a really good car. Kai had some unlucky brakes there. I had to change an engine before the start of the race uh, after qualifying, so he had to start 38th. Um, but... We'll talk about this again when we get to the trucks. It's just great racing at Iowa, and I love it. And I love that the fans got a double feature there. Um, you know, we might say oh, it was a boring race. You know, five second lead for Bell, but you know what? The mid pack racing is sometimes what makes it. And they and people at Iowa and the TV audience got that. Yeah, I think sometimes when you have a situation where you have one guy that's just clearly so much stronger than the rest of the field. It can be very boring because you don't see anybody else really challenging for the lead. But when you get to see guys racing real hard back, you know, in the midfield or not even in the midfield, just the rest of the top ten, I think that that kind of gives more incentive to to enjoy the race. That makes for more of an enjoyable race overall. And uh, you know, great battles in the midfield. Five of the top ten finishers were rookies. Harrison Burton was fourth. Zane Smith was fifth. Noah Gregson was sixth. Chase Briscoe was 7th, and John Hunter Nemechek was 8th. I almost said Ryan Briscoe again. <laughs> that has happened far too many times. I get far too confused. I, I keep thinking they're related. They're not, and no. it's creepy to me. But all four of the Junior Motorsports cars 
were in the top ten. And um, that's a second race in a row too. They found something there at the at JRM right now, and that's and that's good to see. Uh, we need to see some more cars mixing it up with with the big three in the Xfinity series this year with Reddick and Bell. And yeah, Foster. that's what's really interesting is you know you, you know we talk so much about the JRM guys, but the guys that really dominate the Xfinity series are Christopher Bell, Cole Custer, and um, you know. Who else was there? Tyler Reddick. Tyler Reddick, right. And they don't even drive, drive for, for uh, JRM. No. Well, JRM's just set the standard here the yes. last few years. And, you know, this thing, the racing cyclical, and they've got, and, and they've had to relearn whatever this was. And, and Reddick, uh, Bell, and, and, and Custer have had found it over the off season. I know some it seems to make changes. Reddick went from JRM to RCR mm-hmm. and just has instantly caught fire, which is good to see there. Yeah, apparently um, Richard Childers really likes him. I read a story the other day uh, how, you know, they want to run Tyler Reddick at least by next year. Yeah, that'd be interesting. Like in Cup, in Cup, not in Xfinity, but like in Cup. Yeah. And, I mean, if Daniel Hemrick is that highly touted by Richard Childress, then he must really have high hopes for Tyler Reddick then. Mm-hmm. So, anyway, that's the Xfinity Series. We uh, have a lot to talk about more later on about that race. But right now we are going to move on to one of our favorite segments of the show, which is the Featured Paint Scheme. And Josh has selected the 2004 NASCAR Nextel Cup Series Mm -hmm. to be our Featured Paint Scheme. And so, of course... I had to go through with this because I mm. could tell I could tell stories I like your about choice. this. I love your choice, by the way. Oh my gosh, I, I I loved this car when it when I first saw it, um, and I even remember the race because uh, I believe I was on a vacation or something. I was going somewhere and I was listening into it in in the car, and it was a big deal for me because uh, at nine years old I was a big Casey Kane fan so much so that my father enrolled me in the Casey Kane fan club. There you go. So I got I got a lot of. Great perks. I think one year when, because when he was running Bush Series for Atkins Racing, he was sponsored by Great Clips, mm-hmm. and he still got the Great Clips sponsor. But I got Great Clips coupons because of that, like all the time. Nice. So, I mean, I good little perk. Yeah, I almost never paid for a haircut, and I got a bunch of uh, Casey's favorite food recipes from his mom back then too. It was pretty, it was Man, pretty hot, was pretty an great. All inclusive fan club. Oh, Man, it really was. Great. I mean, it really was. I I still have hero cards. Oh, yeah, they're they're not signed. None of, them, none of them are signed, but I still have them. Uh, but that's why. But but there's a big reason why I'm choosing. That's one of the main reasons why I'm choosing this paint scheme. So Casey Kane's number nine Mountain Dew Dodge that ran at Michigan in June of 2004, where he finished second, a familiar place for him. And believe me, nine year old me was really tired of Casey Kane finishing second every single race. It seemed the, the NASCAR world was getting tired of him finishing second. You know, and that's the thing too is. What's so crazy is, and I didn't realize this when I was nine, but I've realized it now later as I've grown up, but a lot of people didn't really like the fact that Ray Evernham chose Casey Kane to replace Bill Elliott. And so, like, the, it, but people immediately changed their tune mm-hmm. when he almost beat Kenseth at Rockingham. In race number two. In race two. Yeah, I think because I remember, because Casey was never really great at restrictor plate races, and he never has been. No. Uh, I, I know he has like one Xfinity win there in, at Daytona, I think, and and he's come close a couple of other times. But Casey is just—I knew this as a kid, and I I kind of didn't care for the plate races at the time because I knew Casey had no shot at him, <laughs> uh, except for in 2005 when t- he went four wide with Tony Stewart and a couple other guys, almost almost won that race. But that was because he took no tires that time. Uh, 2004 Pepsi 400, I think he lost the draft. <laughs> within like the first 15 laps I, I i don't i don't know but i love that car um casey kane uh drove the number nine mountain dew car it was a lighter green color i believe the next year they came out with a little darker green uh to go along with the new mountain dew logo and the new brand they were trying to promote mm-hmm. but he did finish second in that race uh and it's, it's a big deal for me because uh i would drink mountain dew before races as good luck Hey, not, hey, that's that's brand loyalty, and, and motorsports fans have the most brand loyalty out there. So when, when, yeah, I mean, when Casey, I remember I had to have a red shirt that I had, and then I had to have a Mountain Dew, and that was good luck for if Casey K, it's to get for Casey Kane to win. And I'm glad I could talk about that now because he's retired, so it doesn't sound like I'm still fanboying. 
Uh, I will if he, you know, runs a short track race around here, um, if he ever, you know, is able to do that again. Uh, but anyway, we're going to move on and talk about Josh's featured paint scheme, which is also one of my favorites, mm -hmm. uh, because I really like this driver. So, Josh, uh, who's your who's your featured paint scheme today? Well, you know, I fell in love with the uh, the car that ran this for this team the year before. Um when but it was a Pontiac. When too. it was a Pontiac, uh, driven by Jack Sprague. So Ward Burton's uh, number zero, net zero, high-speed Chevrolet. He drove for uh, a Haas CNC, and um, that was a really just cool car. It was the, the, the regular paint scheme that ran really all most of the season, I should say. Ward ran the first 34 races before being let go, and Mike Bliss was hired to take over the final two races of that season. He sat on the outside pole for the Brickyard that year, too. Yes, he did. I was just about to mention that. That was great. That was a great <laughs> uh, great day. It was, a, it was just so cool-looking paint scheme. I like the black and the red, and then how they incorporate the Net Zero Z mm -hmm. into the logo, or the uh, logo, the uh, the scheme of the car, and it just, it just I got a, I got a die cast of it, and... and it's really just neat. I, if I wasn't, I, I when I played video games, I didn't like to drive as Jeff Gordon. I'm right. Jeff Gordon. Uh, he's a Case Cam fan. I'm a Jeff Gordon fan. I didn't like to drive as Jeff Gordon. I don't know why. I didn't want to wreck, wreck him. I would choose Ward Burton for for, for uh, it was the NASCAR 2005 Chase for the Cup. Yes, game, one, one so. of my personal favorite games. Yeah, of all so time. that I would always drive Ward's car uh, or Brian Vickers car. What's well, that's a story for another day. So. Um, he only had two top ten finishes in the car, though. Just didn't have a great year, and then he wouldn't return until two thousand and six. Ward Ward wouldn't. So um, he ran most. He tried to run kind of a full season with Morgan McClure. Yeah, that was like in two thousand and seven. But yeah. he DNF'd a lot. Or DNQ. Yeah, a lot, he, so. I mean two thousand and seven. I I look back at that and I think about how many cars were there. Were it trying to make a race every week? Yeah, it was like some. I mean, what what, what did they have they for had, the Daytona 500 one year? Close to like 60 cars or yeah, something. Yeah, that was a days I wish we could get, bring back. It wasn't even all that long ago. It either. wasn't all that long ago. It was I know genuinely that. not even all that long ago. So yeah. I mean, ah oh man, I. But I love Ward. I love Ward Burton. Um, I'll always love Ward Burton. When I was a kid, I always dreamed about what it would be like if Ward Burton were a commentator. Oh my goodness! Uh, I would I would die happy if <sighs> someone you know if Fox does you know how Fox does those guest analysts stuff? yeah yeah someone get Ward Burton up there that just would be, for us that would be great uh, and Ward's a pretty good if you don't follow Ward Burton on Twitter you should because uh, he he posts some nature and, and preservation and environmental stuff uh, but he can also be pretty he can be pretty funny on there too oh he's, so he's how best. he incorporates it so you know speaking of Burtons. Let's move on to another race where a Burton did proved his worth, I think. That was the uh, m ms 200 for the NASCAR Gander Outdoors Truck Series. Now, Harrison Burton wasn't necessarily the biggest topic. There were two other ones that really dominated that race. Yes, that um, this truck race was probably the most eventful truck race I have seen in a while. Yes. Well, let's talk about the first thing that happened, and that was the incident with uh, Johnny Sauter and Austin Hill. Oh. Man. That was uh yeah, let's let's get let's just get that right out of the way because I feel like there's we need to just get that right out of the way. So if you don't if you if you miss the truck race for whatever reason or if you've been living under a rock for the last couple of days um or if you're just not that big into racing, I don't know, then why wouldn't you why would you be listening to this? Or you just stay off social media. Or you're my mom. Okay. I don't I don't know. Um hi mom. Anyway, uh so the point is Johnny Sauter and Austin Hill had an on track incident where Austin Hill got into the back of uh, Johnny Sauter, moved him out of the way, and, uh, and before that though, Johnny had made contact. Yeah. Well, we don't know if there's anything that transpired beforehand. Going down into turn one, Sauter got in the rear end of Austin Hill, got him upset. Johnny almost kind of spun out himself, continued on and passed. Now they had history. Johnny was upset with Austin from last week. Uh, some incident and wreck that happened at Texas Motor Speedway. So I'm sure that maybe played a role in this. Well, Austin Hill took exception into turn three and four. Yeah. Bumps bumps the thirteen of Sauter. Sauter backs it into the wall. And he waits for Austin and hunts him down on, under the yellow and I'm and, wrecks and wrecks him. I mean yeah, there's no just night. Wrecks him. Just wrecks him. And I think he wanted to try and do more based off of the way he kinda continued the the, the T bone 
move there, but then Hill's car spun completely uh, on its side there, and Johnny's had to continue at that point. So um, it was really interesting because series sponsor is, is Gander Outdoors, and one of the executives of Gander Outdoors is, is Marcus Lomonas. Oh, he owns the whole thing. Uh, yeah, that's true. He does own it. Um, he, he He's big in the sport. And, and I love everything that he does. And, I, and, I, and NASCAR, too. Yeah, he is, he's really a game changer. I wish more executives were like him. Um, but he tweeted after the race. He actually quoted a tweet from Nick Bromberg. And in Nick Bromberg's tweet read, Johnny Sauter has set himself up for suspension after crashing Austin Hill and retaliation under Yellow. But given that Sauter has already won a race and made the truck playoffs, what really is a fair punishment in this case Attached was a gif of Sauter wrecking Hill, and uh, Marcus Lemonis uh, retweeted with a quote and said, Totally unacceptable behavior. Run hard, turn hard, push the limit, but find the clear line between right and wrong. It was crossed. Not my call, and it's good that it's not. Hashtag Gander Trucks, hashtag respect. Then he, uh, at USA Today, at Fox Sports, at NASCAR Trucks, at NASCAR, at NASCAR on Fox. He added he used every character he could on that one. So he was clearly upset. I mean, the, the guy who... I think he added the wrong people, though. Those are just social media people that aren't going to know yeah. what he's talking about. <laughs> well, it is, the USA one today was one that really got me there. So let, let's talk about this. Um, yeah. What, 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 what's your initial thoughts on, on what should happen? Well, first and foremost, I'm going to admit my bias to say that I've never really been a huge Johnny Sauter fan. I think he's done stuff like this in the past that's really, not necessarily to this extent, but, you know, he's got he's got a history there where he loses his temper from time to time, and um, I just think that, I, I think that he, he went over, he went too far because it, well, it wasn't even all that big of a deal in the grand scheme of things. Um, yeah, he had a little bit of a wrecked truck, but it wasn't like it was all that bad. I think wrecking Austin Hill later hurt his truck more than the initial contact did. I think it's just a retaliation move that really wasn't well thought through, well thought out at all. And, uh, you know, we go back and we, we made comparisons to, you know, when Matt Kenseth wrecked Joey Logano a couple of years ago and when Kyle Busch wrecked Ron Hornaday in 2011 and I talked about this, you know, before the show, and I'll talk about it right now. Uh, when Kyle Busch did what he did in 2011 to, to Ron Hornaday, I took a big problem with that because it was under caution, and it was turn him straight, into turn the him, wall. yeah, he turned him straight head on into the fence. That could really seriously hurt not only Hornaday but someone else uh, because you have to keep in mind that under caution. Marshals and safety workers and people are out on the track, and if you are driving like that, that recklessly on the track, under caution, you become a danger and a hazard to everyone else, and Absolutely. you need to be parked immediately. So when Na- NASCAR decided to park Kyle Busch for the remainder of the weekend, I felt it was a fair punishment. Matt Kenseth going against Joey Logano, on the other hand, I felt was an unfair punishment. Because Matt Kenseth wrecked Logano under yellow. He did it at green, Martinsville. Under green. under green, excuse me, you're right. He, he wrecked Joey Logano under green, and it was at Martinsville. And the extent of the damage to Logano's car was far more than Lega- than any kind of risk Logano would have been put in in that situation. Kenseth was merely paying him back for an accident that had happened the re- week prior that pretty much ruined any chance. I mean, at that point, because Kenseth had... Already had an accident in the race earlier. At that point, Kenseth knew that his championship hopes were gone. He had nothing to lose. He was going to go for broke. And he was just going to get his revenge and call it a day. And that was that. Yeah. Uh, And he did. He did. He got his revenge. He called it a day. And that was that. So when I look at that, I say, you know what? NASCAR should not have suspended him. However, they opened a can of worms by doing so. In this case, if they do not suspend Johnny Sauter, I think it'll be another can of worms. Where what's the line here? You know, where is the line? If we're having guys intentionally wreck other uh, other guys under caution, we need to do something about that. Because I don't have a problem with boys have at it on the racetrack when the green flag's out and there's no marshals, there's no safety workers, there's nobody walking out on the track 
that could get hurt. That's all good and fine. You know, when you when you want to wreck someone under green, go ahead and wreck someone under green. If you want to wreck someone under yellow, that's when you should be parked. That's my take of it. What are you? What about you, uh, Josh? I'm pretty much in line with you. You know, I think the thing that complicates this, and it, for one, is that this is in the truck series. Um, I'm sure there's going to be some lobbying saying hey we need johnny in this in this truck um of course you know not saying that joe gibbs wouldn't have lobbied for kyle bush to be in the cars the next on saturday and sunday back oh m&m is almost pulled out yeah. entirely after that so i don't even know if it's a sponsorship deal well and they it this implications of johnny missing a race and then i don't know if that you know nick bromberg brought it up what is a fair punishment given that he's already won a race I don't think that encumber should encumber the win. That shouldn't no, that shouldn't be taken in, into consideration because NASCAR's in a tough spot. If they suspend Johnny, do you can't give him a waiver to make the playoffs because you got to race in every race unless you have a uh, a waiver, which is what Ross has been given with with the switch. It's what Kyle Busch was given in 2015 with his injury. It's what Kyle Larson was given, uh, I believe, it was 2016 when he had ex- uh, heat exhaustion and wasn't able to race. Tony Stewart was too, and, and Tony Stewart was. You're, you're absolutely right. I'm certain Denny Hamlin got one at one point for don't think back it was issues. A, don't think something. that was uh, a, didn't have the um, playoff, then did we? Or did they? I can't remember I can't when remember it was. Now. I but, know he in 2013 when he had the accident, but I know Hamlin has had other yeah. like. But this health is, problems flare up. Yeah, but this time. is this is for a non-track. This is nothing to do with health or uh, or a series switch that warrants it. And NASCAR suspends Johnny. You can't give him a waiver and still allow him to make the playoffs. Um, so I think it's either going to be we're going to you're going to get fined really hard and by by points and money because you got to send a message to Johnny that this is unacceptable behavior. I would, I'm in totally agreeance with you. You know, race as hard as you can. Under green, and if you want to get boys have at it under green, do it. Under caution is not the time to do it because guys are relaxing. Uh, under caution, you never know. Uh, like I, I brought it to you, Austin Hill could have had his hand in a, in a bad position on the steering wheel, and he gets hit, and car gets jerked. He has a broken wrist as a result, maybe even a dislocated elbow or, or shoulder as a result. So that's not good on, on Johnny's part, and Johnny should know better. I mean, I get it. We, he's a hothead, and 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 that's that, that's not a hot take. That is that is a, that's truth. God bless so, America. <laughs> so he's he's got to he's got to know better, and he should know better. I'm sure if he could do it over again, he wouldn't do that. In the moment, he had a bit of road rage, but NASCAR can't take that. You know, okay, you, you made a mistake. You got to punish it the way it is. I think he should get parked for Gateway, and will and should not be given a waiver and. Is that going to hurt Thor Sport potentially? Is it going to make some sponsors upset? Probably, but you know that falls on Johnny's sh- shoulder. NASCAR has to make through has to react to what was what was given, not give special considerations because this is the Truck Series or this is the Xfinity Series, this is the Cup Series. We can't treat the series differently. And the, at the end of the day, we're all playing by essentially the same rules, and NASCAR can't. I, I don't think they can. There's a precedent been set. Granted, it was extremely um, much more uh, egregious with Kyle Busch in 2011 with Ron Hornaday. Um, but I'm guessing that Johnny Sauter was trying to shove Hill up into the wall, and, and he kind of wasn't successful at that. But you can't, and you also can't take into consideration what happened, so or what actually happened compared to the intent. So it was the intent that they need to. Uh, punish not the actual outcome. Yeah, I'm I'm not so sure what they're going to do here. I think if they park him, they're not going to be... Thor Sport's not going to be happy because now their entire season is for naught. They, there's no possible way they can win the championship now. Not with him. Yeah, three, not with they him. They got three other cars. Yeah. And, it, and it just... And it just... It kind of makes it, it kind of makes it pointless to have Johnny in the car anymore. And, you know, it could lead to, to something else where, you know, Johnny... Ends up not running for Thor Sport anymore. It could end up being like sponsors don't care anymore. They pull out, and then Johnny doesn't have a ride anyway. Yeah. You know, I don't know. It's a bad move on his part. He should have thought it over. He should have thought it much better. Mm-hmm. You know, if he wanted to get him back, he should have waited. You know, until the green flag fell, and then, yeah. then gotten him back. And I don't have this. There's and here's a here's another aspect of this before we move on to the whole Ross Chastain thing. I you know we just oh yeah we've got to talk about that but first. I don't have a problem with. 
we've seen this, a guy going up to a guy under caution, maybe rubbing doors and say, hey, dude, I didn't appreciate that. Mm-hmm. But when you step over the line, the line to me is when you step over it and you intentionally try to wreck a guy. That is where the line is crossed because we see bump, bump in the, in, the, in, in the back with bumper to bumper, door slamming a little bit, not like, whoa, I swung way to the right there, I swung way to the left, depending on what side of the car you're on. But you can't go wrecking the guy. That to me is the line. Um, we mentioned the waiver. We mentioned Ross Tastain. His life just got oh my god a little just bit more guy. complicated. You know he was the original winner. Dom- he dominated that oh, race. Oh gosh, that race was his from the start. He made a comment, um, I believe, on MRN the other day, saying I, he wasn't passed all day long. And I'm thinking, I don't think he actually was passed all day long. So that's he was that, doing all the passing. He was doing all exactly all the passing. So wins wins both stages, gathers. That's 20 uh, points, championship mm-hmm. points he got. Then Which he, goes he needed. Out and he needed because he was 63 points or something like that out uh, from the uh, championship uh, to 20th place, excuse me. And then he goes out and wins the race. So that's 40 points. So he's got 60 points and he's locked into the playoffs shooting in the top 20 um, in, in points, which was a formality because he was only 14 points out. Well, we learned about an hour after the race. NASCAR changed the rules this year. If the car is illegal, they're going to DQ you if you're the winner. And, well, it could have happened to a nicer guy. And this we is the first time it's happened. First too, time it's crazy. happened. Um, in the Truck Series, even, uh, uh, the Truck Series Managing Director Brad uh, Moran said in post race inspection uh, that the, in a press conference, that the car was low, extremely low. And uh, therefore, he was DQ'd. Brett Moffat, second place finisher, was elevated to the uh, winner of the race. Matt Crafton was elevated to the winner of stage one. And Ben Rhodes was elevated to the winner of stage two. Which is interesting because I didn't know that's how that, that was going to work. Well, I was like, they de- de- if they disqualify the winner, do they take away his stage wins too? And apparently, yes. Yeah, sure yeah, enough, they, you they, lose your stage wins too. Take away everything. So Chastain gets moved down to 32nd finishing. So he gets 32nd pay, 32nd points. The good news is... Team can appeal. They can appeal this, and they're, we're recording this on Tuesday. Tomorrow morning, maybe when you're listening to this, the appeal will be heard. And the team is saying, uh, Nice Motorsports is saying that it was due to minor damage in the event. I can almost believe that because, and I'll tell you why, what, what, whether it's wrong or right or wrong, I was bumpy. Mm-hmm. And if maybe they were trying to push the line and they had a spring or a shock or something in there that broke in a way that they didn't expect or failed or didn't hold up the way they expected. And Iowa is extremely bumpy. And those corners, particularly through one and two, are harsh and they're they're tough on the trucks. So it is believable to me that this happened, but the problem is maybe you pushed the limit too much. You didn't compensate it. It sucks Mm -hmm. because, like, okay, we didn't intentionally do this because they passed the pre-race inspection. And I think their only defense is going to be there was actually something broke, like a clip, or or there was a chassis uh, that was bent and broke the result of the, all the bumps. I don't I don't know what that's going to what that I think the ride the, height rules already or yeah. well, they need, have, to, need to be fixed anyway because yeah. this is a main issue of that. But and this is important too. This is important to remember. We wanted this. this yeah, is people what NASCAR, wanted this. This is what NASCAR screamed. Now. Uh, on Twitter, I was like looking on some of the, the tweets and just people responding, you know, oh, this sucks for Ross. Kid can't catch a break. This is BS. Um, NASCAR and, fans will never be pleased. Uh, well, uh, but yeah, well, and then someone tweeted, if this is Kyle Bush, y'all be cheering. Yeah, and that for is, real. And that is true. That is exactly true. Um, and I think that's what's upset. The first guy that, that gets this, whether it's the cup, Xfinity, or truck, gets, gets Ross Chastain. Yep. And the guy who struggled, I mean, the guy. Got a break last year with Chip Ganassi, and and one even won a race. Got the big break of his career. He's going to be driving for him full time this year in the Xfinity Series. Then we have the whole sponsorship issue in in December. Goes DC Solar is a Ponzi scheme. The colleague race. He gets a break with colleague racing this year to run a few races. Doesn't get the couple wins he thought he could get um, at Daytona or Talladega. Says you know what this Nice Motorsports thing's going really well right now. I just dropped out of the top twelve in Xfinity. I want to go down there. Um, he knew he was going to get reset. Nothing would be retroactive. But he wins this. He wins this race. Then he gets DQ'd. And the, I mentioned this to you before, and you didn't even think about it. What was not present at Iowa this weekend? The NASCAR Pro System for, for officiating. 
Earlier in that race, Ross Chastain had a clear uncontrolled tire violation, which would have sent him to the back of the longest line. Probably would have kept him from winning the race, which would have kept him from being uh, teched uh, in, in such a way at the end of the race that would have DQ'd him and uh, as the winner. So, darn it. He could have still had some points there. Wouldn't have had the best points, a better point day that he could have had. But he got a break in the race. Literally not winning the race would have been the ideal situation exactly. for Ross Chastain. Exactly. And then he, oh, it, was just, it was a tough day for Ross. But I have no doubt in my mind that Ross, hopefully there's not any more points penalties for him, for that team. Because he's 60-some points out now, still with um, with now seven races to go before the truck championship. I have no doubt in my mind that that Nice Motorsports team is going to rebound and they're going to win a race again. I think they can do it. And Ross is probably the only guy in any of these three garages who has the mental uh, durability, the mental mindset, because he's been through this before, to rebound and fight through this. So he can do this. I really do think he can. The point, the, the problem is going to be winning a race and getting into the top 20 points. The top 20 points wasn't a problem two races ago. Now it just got a little more complicated. So hopefully he can win. The, the, the easiest solution to that is go out, win stage one and two at Gateway, win Gateway, go to Kentucky, win stage one, win two, win two there, win Kentucky, and, 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 and that's the easiest way for them to do it. Um, I, I know I've talked a lot about here. What, 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 you're, what, you have any more thoughts to add on to that Ross Chastain issue? No, I think you nailed most of it. I think you're... You nailed a lot of that, a lot of that that I really didn't even think about. I didn't even really, you know, you you were you're on top of things today. Um, so I'm, but you know, understanding that, going off of that, I'm gonna we're gonna shift here again. No pun intended. To our favorite, our favorite, favorite, favorite segment of the show: upshift or downshift. It's going. It's a simple process. A question or a or a. Uh, Statement, a statement question, is, yeah. is posed, and we decide whether or not we're going to upshift or agree or downshift or disagree on the statement yeah. or question. Yeah. So the first question for today uh, is going to be, Haley Deegan lost the lead on a late race restart at Colorado National Speedway last week. She dived into a corner on teammate Derek Krause that resulted in him spinning, and Deegan w- went on to win. Her third victory in the previous eight races spanning back to last season. Are you upshifting or downshifting on this move, Josh? I'm upshifting. I don't got a problem with it. I know everyone's complaining that every single one for wins have involved have involved contact. Like first off, this is short track racing. Um, you know, go back to her first career win last uh, fall at, at Meridian in, in Idaho. Okay, that was that was just a, a hole that was there. Last lap of the race. Let's stick. You know, stuck her nose down there. You can't if you the moment you quit trying to go for a hole, you quit racing. Okay, Las Vegas. It's dirt, okay? It's dirt. And there was some loose, the, 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 the slow car, the leader didn't have great position. She saw the opening, made it, made the move. And then this, this week here too, she felt like she was maybe done wrong by Derek when he went three wide on the restart, made her go up the track. She had to fight for second. And, and uh, you know what? There's a guy named Dale Earnhardt who did the same thing. So I'm upshifting this move. I think she, she's a great personality. Uh, she's very likable as a driver. She says what she wants. She said, I don't care. I'm going to do it. I'm going for the win. Upshift. Yeah, I'm going to take a quick upshift on that too because, you know, I, if you look at the context of the whole thing, Derek Krause got into her first. So all she did was bump him back. Exactly. And what's the problem with that? I mean, you're in short track race and it's the K&N series. you got to be aggressive in order to pass some, some butt people. I don't see what the problem is. I'm upshifting too. I agree with the move. I wouldn't have done anything different, you know, just because it's Haley Deegan. If this was anyone else, would we be complaining? I maybe, we, you know, maybe we would. She's but... a well-known name in that series. If this is Derek Cross who made that move, we're not talking about this today. I'm sorry. I, maybe we, maybe we should be, but we wouldn't be talking about Haley Deegan um, we... being who she is. And that, not to sound sexist, but is because she's a girl and she's has maybe the best shot. Uh, to make it to the Cup Series and be successful that any uh, female has had in, in, in NASCAR's history. Go back to, like, the Battle at the Beach when we had that. Exactly. Kyle Larson completely dumped people. Guys just dumped people. We don't talk about that. We don't talk about that. But that caused a ton of controversy, and that was a big problem for a long time. You know, but this wasn't dumping. This was a bump. This was mm-hmm. a, you know, 
We saw Harry Hyde. He didn't hit you. He didn't ru- wreck you. He just rubbed you. And rubbing son is racing, yep. and that's the way it's always going to be. Yep. So, Anyway, exactly. moving on to the next question. Kyle Busch should relinquish Rudy Fugel, who is the team's best crew chief and arguably the best crew chief in Truck Series history, to either Harrison Burton or Todd Gilland. Do you upshift or downshift on that, Josh? I upshift because, one, you know, Kyle comes out and, and says, we talked about this last week, you know, comes out and says, you know, I gave this team a 2 out of 10. Why do you have the best crew chief on a team that's running a very amount of drivers? And granted, I go, no, you don't want to lose to your two drivers, so you want to have the best crew chief. But if these guys are struggling, I would relinquish him, upshift. Um, you know, put your best people together. And right now, you have your best, maybe your best asset at that team is working on a team for a truck that is fielding multiple drivers. So, if you want to actually win a drivers' championship, put Rudy Fugel on this on the on probably the the the, the pit stand of Burton, but Gillen would be fine too. You know, you need to put your best assets together. Upshift. Well, I don't. I I I see where you're coming from on that. I think for for me personally, I think that you know those guys. You need to know if you're going to give your best crew chief to somebody. You need to know that they're going to have the best opportunity to succeed, because the crew chief can create as many strategy plans and has come up with as many you know hypothetical ways to win the race as they possibly can. But at the end of the day, if the driver behind the wheel is not going to cut the mustard, then you're just kind of wasting his time, you know. So I think that's probably why Kyle Busch hasn't gone ahead and done any of this yet, because you know I he doesn't know. I mean, if it was clear as day that, you know, like when Christopher Bell, Eric Jones, uh, William Byron were in his trucks, yeah, clear as day, okay, fine, That that's when I would probably upshift on that, but I think since he doesn't have a clue, and I mean, we're, we've talked about Harrison Burton, we talked about Todd Gilliland last week, I don't really think any of them need Rudy Fugel or have shown me that they deserve him yet, uh, maybe he would help them develop. But that's a that's a call that you know Fugel and Burton Gill and, and Bush should make. You know that's not a call I'm going to make. Uh, and if quite honestly neither of them have made that call, then I don't think it's going to happen, and I don't think it should happen. So that's why I'm going to downshift, even though you've upshifted. Uh, Unless we're disagreeing on something. Yeah, we actually disagree on something. That's surprising. That's good. Uh, but anyway, so let's move on to the second one, or, or excuse me, the third one. The French Grand Prix is scheduled a week right after the 24 Hours of Le Mans. Are you shifting up or downshifting back to on back-to-back big race weekends for the French people? Uh, what about so? I'm gonna hold my tongue first. What do you think, Josh? I kind of I think it's unfair in a way. I know that the F1 schedule is, is a complicated thing, and then, and uh, I would try if I'm F1 to to move the French Grand Prix maybe later to summer, so that you know I'm downshifting because of the, the schedule placement. Um, just for that reason, um, yeah, I, I feel like it's just, it's, you know, you have two big world championship events and they're eight days apart, nine, maybe, you know, technically maybe nine days apart, depending on how you want to count it, but, you know, switch it maybe with, the uh, you know, uh, Ring or, or Silverstone and, you know, we got these new con, you know, they're raising these new contracts coming up, make that part of the negotiation and I'm sure maybe, you know. Well, a card might 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 appreciate it too. What what are your thoughts? Well, I mean, I'm I'm gonna upshift just because I think it's a great opportunity. It allows more Formula One drivers to run Le Mans because they're already in France. You know, they don't have to you know worry about visas. They don't have to worry about traveling. They don't have to worry about you know stuff like that. They you know they're already in France. So I don't have a personal problem with it. That's a fair point. I'll give you. I'll, that's a fair point. That's good. I mean, I think you know if they wanted to change it. That's fine, but I think we heard so much about clashes with Le Mans and the F1 calendar and the Formula E calendar with WEC in the past that I think this is a good way to, you know, kind of get around that. You know, now if F1 drivers want to run Le Mans, there's nothing stopping them because, hey, we're already in France. We go to France in the next week, so, hey, I will just stay here and get some extra sleep, you know, get worked up, and then go for go from there. I don't really see a problem with it. If, F, if F1 drivers who do run Le Mans... And then run Paul Ricard, ex- experience, you know, exhaustion, ex- you know, experience situations where, you know, they might be incredibly tired or something, then yeah, maybe you could 
change it for that sense. But I think, no, it, it's great for the drivers, and I think it's great for the French fans, so too. So I'm going to go ahead and upshift on that. Well, one more thing on that. That could happen if I put Silverstone in that spot or another European race. You could say that about, about them. I was coming from, oh, more, yeah, from the sure. standpoint of you know, maybe the two, I don't know if the, I want, I'll speak for the French people, but maybe the two biggest weekends for them with F1 and in and, and, and the 24 Hours of Le Mans, being back to back weekends, I feel like they're getting they're getting they're getting cheated in that way that okay, now I gotta wait well, 50, too, 50 yeah. weeks before fifty weeks before the next big before the next big week. That was my that was my point on it. But you know, your your point is good too, that it allows the Formula One guys to already be there and participate in that. So that's good. So what do we got for the next one? Yeah, our next uh, question here is Greg Biffle and Kyle Bush Motorsports missed the entry deadline for the M and M's two hundred and therefore was unable to enter a fifth truck if they wanted per NASCAR rules. Uh, what do you think about this, Josh? Do you upshift that the NASCAR rules are correct, or are you downshifting on there? I think uh, I- I'm downshifting on the NASCAR rules. Um, I think NASCAR could have definitely made an exception. This is a good marketing and promoting tool, and all the wind that was in that sail for this this, this triple truck challenge, the trip that Biffle won in his, in his return to NASCAR, not the structures, but the return to NASCAR, it's just taken out because that piece of that puzzle is missing. Mm-hmm. And I think NASCAR, one, I think could have made an exception. And two, I think the rules are too, too, too stringent. So I'm kind of downshifting on both those. You know, I get why you got to have an entry rule. But do you make an exception for a fifth truck, particularly in this situation which is a great promotional tool for the series and the sport? Yeah, I'm going to agree with you on that one. I'm going to upshift as well because I think that, you know, NASCAR is – Four car rule, five car. Well, they don't have a four car or, rule or five car limit in in truck or Xfinity. They don't have that limit down there. Well, still, it's dumb. I guess, <laughs> yeah, it's dumb. But you know, I think if you do miss the entry deadline, I understand why that's a problem. Should they have made an exemption? Yeah, absolutely. Especially in that situation, um, if you're going to create a promotion like that, then yeah, you need to make an exception because that would be like someone, you know, going for the Winston Million and then all of a sudden having something happen to them and they can't win. They can't. They don't have a chance at it now. You know, that would just kind of make the whole promotion pointless. Mm-hmm. So that's where I am. I'm, I'm going to stand. And so for our last question on upshift or downshift, this one comes kind of more from my perspective because as I was watching the 24 Hours of Le Mans, I watched on Motor Trend, which is how you were able to watch in the U.S., and it just was bad. And so my question is, Motor Trend's coverage of the 24 Hours of Le Mans featured a lot of issues with commercial breaks, and it looked like they tried to time commercials with the Eurosport commercials, but failed, causing interrupted statements and random cutting in and out. With, I mean, there was a period of time there, I think, that was very weird where it said, where they cut to a break, like in the middle of someone's sentence, and then they played commercials, and then they came back, and then the Eurosport commentator said, oh, and this was like maybe about a minute later, so okay, we're going to go take a break now, and then they cut out again. So it's like the race director, whoever was directing or something, there was an error of communication, you know, and keep in mind, this is Le Mans, they didn't sell, it's not like F1 where they sell all the rights for advertising, so they don't need to add, I mean, people actually bought advertising rights to advertise during Le Mans, and you're trying to find a time to, you know, actually cut in and cut out of those those commercial breaks and you know as we can sit here and rant and rant and rant and rant about ads but i understand that they're a a pivotal and important part to how television works Mm -hmm. and how the television economy works and i can't sit here and say oh i wish they just ran no ads because then that would mean motor trend makes no money off of airing this which means they have no real incentive to air it Mm -hmm. which means that united states fans wouldn't have a chance to watch le mans at least you know legally uh, and so I say that because I think I miss Fox's coverage of it because they had actual people in there. They had Bob Varsha, they had their sports car crew actually talking you through it, actually, or even in their Formula E coverage where they use uh, the world feed as well. They at least have a host to kind of make the transitions from commercial breaks and, and in and out kind of work. And I like how when they do take commercial breaks, like in Formula E, you know, when they come back, the host kind of explains what happened, while we, what we missed. Sure. You know, why can't Motor Trend do something like that? Because they use the same people for Eurosport. They just did the exact same coverage for Eurosport, but, you know, it's... We're not watching Eurosport. We're watching Motor Trend. So, mm-hmm. you know, why can't we have 
an actual uh, United States-based presenter talking to us about the race and informing us and helping, you know, make advertising breaks flow a little bit more instead of just randomly stopping in the middle. I mean, that's really what it felt like. I mean, you would have a commentator talk, you would see a battle for position happening, or maybe a, 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 a prototype pass a GT car, and then the next thing you know, it just cuts to commercial abruptly, and you, you miss the whole thing. So, I think personally Motor Trend should either invest in a host for next year, or just give it to NBC or Fox or someone who actually cares. So are it. you saying you're upshifting for a new TV provider? Or, absolutely. Or, or I'm absolutely upshifting. I mean, Eurosports coverage can be as good as anyone says, but the fact of the matter is Motor Trend made it look awful. Uh, I Well, based on what you're saying, I unfortunately didn't get to watch it. Um, but I can, I can understand your feelings on that. Yeah, so upshift. I mean... I think it's a, a prime opportunity for NBC to step in, and, and you know they they have one. They have so many other championships. You know they just picked up the Indianapolis 500, uh, and look, they have proven that they're the Motorsports Network. Mm-hmm. I mean, look at all the properties that they got. I wish they still had F1. Uh, oh man, me too. Uh, you know, if they could have if they could have the Big Four, and what I call the Big Four, someone might disagree with me on this. But what I call the big four is, you know, NASCAR, IndyCar, IMSA, and Formula One. So you got all four of those properties. I think you're sitting pretty pretty. Um, and if you can get the 24 hours of Le Mans, which is it's a, it's a kind of well, not really a one-off race, but it's a big championship event for, for the World Endurance Cars. So go, definitely go out there. and Motor Trend has the full WEC rights. Uh, and that's the thing that bothers me is because when I was watching like Sebring or stuff on there, I mean the same thing happened. I mean, I understand when this kind of situation happens when you're broadcasting something from overseas, but this kind of same kind of crap went on during Sebring when you're literally right there. It, it's it's in it's here in our state. Why can't we send somebody to just host? Like, just all you got to do is put up a camera, or not even a camera. You just got to send some sit, have somebody sit back in a studio, just like Fox does, and like guide you through the commercial breaks. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm asking for. I mean, pay me to do it. I'll do it for <laughs> cheap. Come on. He'll, he'll, he'll do it for 100 bucks a day, won't, won't you? I'll do it for... Uh, actually, I'll do it for $100 in Nintendo eShop credit. Dang. Yeah, that's how much I'll do it for. All right. That means I could buy some Switch games. That's totally fine with me. Well, all right. Well, there you go. Now, why, now, before we move on, why don't you tell us a little bit about the 24 Hours of Le Mans? Yeah, actually, that is our next subject anyway. We're going to talk about the 24 Hours of Le Mans. I was able to watch a large uh, portion of it. Uh, I'm not as good as I used to be in watching. I, there was one year where I watched 23 out of the 24 hours. That's pretty I was good. very proud of myself. Um, but I haven't been able to do that since because sleep schedules are weird, and sometimes I fall in and out of sleep. So I'm, too, I'm old now. I'm older, much older now. Uh, but Fernando Alonso, Kazuki Nakajima, and Sebastian Buemi won... 24 Hours of Le Mans after their teammates, their team team car, uh, driven by Mike Conway, Kamui Kobayashi, and Jose Maria Lopez, had a tire problem in the final hour. There was an issue in which they detected a tire uh, failure, and it turned out to be the wrong tire, and it just kind of all collapsed for them. Boy, that's that's heartbreaking. That's gut-wrenching. It's almost as bad as getting the, the wind taken away from you, but because that's pretty much what happened. I mean, it would have been like the same as... I mean, at least they finished... They got to stand on the podium instead of like being excluded from it. But yeah. uh, Fernando Alonso said afterwards he didn't feel like he deserved to win the race. Well, which yeah, I saw like, they led, the, the team car they led like 300-some laps. Yes. They only led 50-some laps. I would feel a little bad. Yeah, the Alonso, Nakajima, and Buemi car the, was not not good at all. Uh, they, were, they were talking in the broadcast several times about how it seemed like nobody could find a decent balance in that car. So no driver was happy while driving it, which means it just didn't have the pace that it needed to compete with its teammate. Uh, and the only way reason it won was because its teammate had a problem in the final hour, which is, I mean, they still finished one two, but a lot of people, but Alonso said, you know, we didn't really win this race. Reverse, you, you know, reverse. yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Um, but uh, finishing third in uh, overall and in the LMP1 class was Mikhailo Lotion, Vitaly Petrov, and Stoffel Van Dorn, which is a huge deal because I feel like Stoffel Van Dorn has been snake bitten. We talked about Ross Chastain being very unlucky, but Stoffel Van Dorn for the past like 
two years straight, maybe three, has had nothing but bad luck in everything that he runs. Uh, if he wasn't, he he gets a, he, he has this wonderful junior career, right? And then he finally gets called up to McLaren, and that's just when McLaren starts to be complete garbage. And so he leaves McLaren, and he goes to Formula E, and his Formula E team is now complete garbage. Uh, so he goes and runs Le Mans, and he finishes third with SMP with uh, some very good Russian drivers in Vitaly Petrov and Mikhail Loshin. So I'm, I'm, I'm good, good for Stoffel. He needed that. Um, however, post-race, there were some penalties. Uh, the top finishing Ganassi Ford, number 68 of Sebastian Bourdais, Joey Han, and Dirk Mueller was disqualified after FIA after the FIA found an illegal fuel take capacity. Wasn't it like 0.1 liter over? Yes, it was that's, very, very that's close. Tight. It was very similar to the winning LMP2 card being disqualified from last year. Uh, they had a, an illegal device to speed up the pit stops, but uh, similarly speaking, the winning GTE AM car of Keating Motorsports, driven by Ben Keating, Euron Bleak Molin, and Felipe Fraga, was disqualified for also exceeding fuel capacity, uh, as well as after their 55.2 second penalty for not meeting the 45 second minimum refueling requirement. So lots of fueling problems in Le Mans this year. And uh, then, of course, I just wanted to talk about this because I thought it was funny. Um, I get home from work. Uh, after watching uh, Lamar at work, and uh, I'm about to fall asleep. I'm about falling asleep. It's about early morning hour, and uh, I was explaining to my girlfriend a little bit, you know, Pastor Maldonado, because they were talking about him, mm -hmm. and he had just started his stint in his car uh, for for the run, and I was talking to her, and I was describing, you know, how many times, how he was very crash-prone in Formula 1, so much so that there's multiple Maldonado crash compilations of just Maldonado crashes from his entire junior career and Formula 1 career. And it, it, the video has to be at least five minutes long, and they're just little clips each time. So, like, little, like, maybe five-second clips, five, six, seven, eight-second clips. So it's very hilarious. And then what do you know? Maldonado bins it. He bins it, and he crashes, and he takes out his team car and the rest of the team. And what do you expect with Maldonado, guys? Come on. Uh, so Pastor, you might be quick, and he was quick, but he still hasn't learned how to keep it out of the fence yet. So someday, someday I believe that Pastor Maldonado will recreate 20, the 2012 uh, Spanish Grand Prix by actually winning but he's going to have to finish the race first, which I am I wonder if he'll be able to. You know, that refueling thing, the whole... I read about that, and that was nuts. The team was... Uh, they averaged 44.4 seconds on their refueling, and therefore they pitted 23 times, so you have to take that .6 times uh, 23, and, and then you wind up with 55.2. That, that, to me, seems like something that would be easy to cover as a as a crew you know and even i play a little safe I'm like okay the, the stopwatch said 45.1 but i think it was 44.6 so that's what i'm going to count it as and i'll be thinking to myself okay next time we got that little we got a little bit of a lead or you know separation when we come in i'm gonna we're gonna make sure we're, we we stay plugged in and take a little bit more fuel than than we you know, or at least uh, it may look like we have more fuel. Oh, absolutely. That's, that's, that to me is a super easy fix that should not have happened. So It should have been a, a lot of it easier. Yeah. I mean, fix, yeah. So, but anyway, that being said, we after finishing Le Mans, now we've officially talked about every single race that happened this weekend, at least that we watched. I did watch MotoGP, and you watched the NHRA, but neither of us really watched enough of those to Oh, I know that John Force came about. close to winning 150. Yeah, uh, and Jorge and Lorenzo... Was, wrecked the top four for me and then let Marquez win yeah and what could have been a great race ended up being just kind of a mark mark Marquez dominant show which is not which is par for the course yeah, in motor GC but usually we get a show before before he inevitably wins yeah so going on to the outstanding performance who'd you have today Rob right my outstanding performance of the weekend but it was a tough tough call for me because there was a lot of drivers at Le Mans that I really wanted to highlight like Stoffel Van Vendorn was one of them um but for me, I think we talked last week about how difficult it is for Kyle Busch, the Kyle Busch Motorsports drivers to do well. Kyle Busch had some comments about them. I talked about them last week saying that, you know, they might need to clean house. And here comes Harrison Burton. Uh, he had top five finishes while pulling double duty, driving two races in the exact same day yeah. for two different teams, two completely separate teams in two completely different types of race vehicle. 450 laps. Yep. 
uh, and he finished in the third position in the truck race and fourth in the Xfinity race. Uh, he stayed up front most of the day in both races, stayed out of trouble, and brought home excellent finishes. Harrison Burton, you proved me wrong, bud. You proved me wrong. You proved Kyle Busch wrong. Uh, just keep it up, and, you know, let's see what happens at, uh, at uh, uh, Gateway. So who's your... Uh, outstanding performance of the weekend, Josh. Well, I, I I sent this to you and for you to do your adding and, and add stuff to it, and I was thinking to myself, darn it, I should have chose Harrison Burton as my outstanding performance. But I didn't want to copy you, uh, and I just, so I left it as my saying. But to say about Harrison Burton, you know, I, I look for him, if he's not in the Xfinity Series next year, maybe because, you know, we got Christopher Bell moving up, no doubt to Cup in twenty. Uh, he Burton. looked good out there in the Xfinity yeah, Series, too. He, exactly. I'm, like, I'm thinking, if I'm Joe Gibbs, I'm like, eh, you know, I think I might have a driver for the 20 car next year, and his name is Harrison Burton. So uh, watch out for him. There's, uh, he's going to be one to watch, and he and he, and he he duked it with some guys, too. He's racing all guy really hard in the Xfinity Series. So, But my guy, Chandler Smith, Okay, this guy wins the ARCA race, and then he goes out. He kind of is granted and inherits the pole because he was fastest and they qualifying gets rained out. So therefore, since he was fastest in practice, guess you're the pole setter now. We don't do you don't do the owner stands like we did now. It's based off of practice times. And that was his debut in the Gander Outdoors Truck Series, driving for Kyle Busch Motorsports in the 51 with Rudy Fugel as his crew chief, might I add. Um, so he led most of the, the beginning part of the race and... He did it without radio communication. He he, he couldn't talk, uh, or couldn't hear his team. So even it had the, uh, uh, the the smarts to say, "Hey, if you want me to pit this time, wave wave the sign so I can see it, and I'll come in and pit." Well, that's what they did, and, and it's very heads up move by the young by the young guy. Um, they had to fix the radio. Almost took his crew member out with them too. Uh, he tried to give his crew member a joyride. That. Might have been frowned upon by NASCAR. Might have. I'm not sure. Um, then he, he's in the back, drives his way up. Then he gets a speeding penalty. Drops back again. But he drives drives forward. Uh, he's, he's able to rebound and, and gets and finishes ninth, but gets elevated eighth with the currently Ross Chastain's uh, DQ. He definitely had one of the top three cars out there. I think Chastain, um, I don't think... Being those low as he was was enough to cause a huge issue for any advantage. I don't think there was an advantage. He just broke the the ride height rule. Okay, so Chastain, Moffat, Chandler had the three best cars out there. Would have been nice to see all three of them racing up there at at the end of the race. And he was racing around guys like Stuart Fries and Johnny Sauter and Matt Crafton during that race, and really going to school, learning a lot, and 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 proving like uh, I think this we're gonna see this guy next year a couple more races, and uh, he's only sixteen, so he can't race full time. Um, but next year, I think we're going to see him in, in the KBM cars or, or trucks a few more times. Well, all right, cool. I like that. Uh, that sounds like very good. Now we're going to move on to our next uh, topic, which is one of our personal favorites, which is I always like this because I learn stuff so all the time from, from this, stuff that I didn't even know before. We're going to move on to our featured track of the week. And Josh, you can go ahead and take it from here and tell us about your featured track of the week. That's our feature track, not my feature track. But uh, it uh, Riverside International Raceway, uh, one of this the, this the lost jewels of racing. Uh, we can talk about that here in a second. But it's located in Riverside, California. Uh, the primary circuit was a nine-turn road course at uh, three point two seven miles in length. There was a shorter two and a half mile circuit in NASCAR used a two point six two mile course. The track operated from 1957 to 89, hosted 48 uh, NASCAR Cup events, uh, two events in 1963, and two events from 1971 to 1987. So could you imagine going to a road course twice on today's schedule? That would be great. The uh, same road course, the same, nonetheless, Yeah, the too. same road course. Uh, and into California, too. It was great. It hosted three races, though, uh, in 1981. Why? Uh, three NASCAR Cup races in 1981 because NASCAR said, we want the Daytona 500 to be our, our season opening race. Well, Riverside was the season opening race at that at that point in time. So they moved, basically moved what would have been the season opening race in 1982 to the season ending race in 1981. So Riverside opened and closed the Cup's schedule that year and had three races to boot. So that was great. Eddie Gray won the first NASCAR race there in 1958. Uh, he led... 
uh, the race was 190 laps, and he led the final 43 after Parnelli Jones was involved in a crash who had led every lap up until that point. Bobby Allison won six times. Dan Gurney, Richard Petty, Darrell Waltrip had five victories. And uh, really just a great driver. Tim Richmond had four wins there. Uh, Riverside was the location of Tim Richmond's second win of the 1987 season and his second race of the year because he was sidelined due to what was uh, diagnosed as double pneumonia. Later was complications of, of AIDS. Um, that was a site, uh, Riverside was the site of A.J. Foyt's nasty crash in 1965. Uh, the season opening race for NASCAR that year in the Motor Trend 500. His brakes failed, and he went into with a keyhole, crashed, flipped. Just a nasty wreck. Go look it up on YouTube. Um, it's amazing. I can understand why. Um, it was uh, Parnelli Jones who revived him and, and said, Hey, I think I see movement here, and he survived. He had, a, amongst many injuries, he had a broken back. Um the dog leg that was uh, that some people will remember the track by was added in 1969 to help slow cars down instead of going into a tight the tight keyhole uh, of turn nine. It hosted Canyon West races and Canyon, or uh, excuse me, uh, Southwest Tour races as well. Three USAC events were held there with IndyCar events. Uh, Dan Gurney winning uh, twice, Mario Andretti once. Uh, Cart ran there in 1981, 82, and 83 with Rick Mears winning the first two and Bobby Rahal winning the final one. Formula One even visited there once in 1960. Uh, it was uh, their only trip there. Sterling Moss won, won the race. Uh, it was his 13th of his F1 career. He won in a Rob Walker Racing Team Lotus MK18. He led 71 of the 75 circuits, and Jack Brabham was the uh, officially the world champion after that race. I Rock. Uh, visited Riverside 16 times and many variations of sports car racing, Trans Am, Can Am, and IMSA visited the track. Uh, but the down Can Am, uh, Can Am races at Riverside. I know a guy that could tell you plenty of things. He for photograph photographed tons of Can Am races at Riverside. Just fell in love with it. He got me involved and in, got me to fall in love with Riverside and Can Am at the same time. Right. Anyway, continue. Oh, no problem. Unfortunately, the end began. Uh, Les Richter. So if your football fans out there might know who he is, he was a Los Angeles Ram. He had been a fixture at Riverside as an executive since the early 1960s. He sold his share of Riverside to a developer named Fritz Duda. And Duda was a race fan, but again, he was a developer first. And eventually the sprawling Riverside community began to complain about the noise, which has brought down many tracks. I mean, come on. If you live by a racetrack, what do you expect, guys? Exactly. And the land value, which plays another huge part in so many losses, of so many tracks, began to become too much. And it would eventually succumb to the Los Angeles suburbia outreach out to the Imperial Valley. And today, the Moreno Valley Mall, as well as uh, housing uh, complexes, occupy the land, and for which once for 33 years supported Riverside. Rusty Wallace won the final professional motor racing event at the historic venue on June 12, 1988. Rick Hendrick even drove in this race, driving the number 18, Superflow Motor Oil Chevrolet. Um, of course, it was for himself, for Hendrick Motorsports. And the weird thing is he uh, outperformed his three team cars. He finished 15th. He was the first car one lap down. Ken Schrader in the number 25 finished 20th. Daryl Waltrip in the 17 finished uh, 28th, and Jeff Bodine finished 34th. So that was a very interesting race. Uh, for sure, for Rick, he's like, guys, I don't do this every day. You do. What's going on? Um, but uh, today, uh, as always, racing reference at, uh, dot info, racing circus dot info, and lost road courses by Martin Rudlow helped provide today's history. Riverside, my gosh, you can talk about you know you, you can talk about the what ifs uh, of the world. You know what 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 could. Uh, for me, I look think about what could a NASCAR schedule look like, but how could the California racing scene look different today if, oh, if Riverside it, was still in existence? If Riverside was still in existence, I have absolutely no doubt in my mind right now that you know California racing out there in general would just be so much more, uh, just so much more vibrant. I think Riverside really was one of the more interesting racetracks because it held and hosted so many different kinds of races. So, so many different kinds. I mean, it was a fixture in the NASCAR schedule. It was a fixture for USAC races for a while. It was a Formula One event. I mean, it was a hugely popular race uh, for sports car fans, hugely popular for Can-Am, IMSA, Camel GT, things like that. 
Uh, just a great, great racetrack overall. One of the more fun racetracks to drive as well. Uh, one of the more interesting layouts because of the long backstretch Very that it had. Backstretch. And downhill, too. Downhill, downhill. long backstretch into what essentially was a long right-handed banked curve. Mm-hmm. Which, man, that also makes it even more unique because it's like what you're, you're the first like two sectors, right, are are road course sectors, right? Where you, you have S's, you have right-handers, you have left-handers, you're going uphill and things like that. And then all of a sudden you get right to the back stretch and you're going flat out, downhill, into a, cur- into a kink, then into a right-handed turn. I mean... You had to approach that that track so much, in so many different ways that you would not normally approach a road course race. Yeah. You almost had to approach it like a drag strip combined with an oval. Yeah, and, and exactly. And, and the dog leg was kind of ahead of its time. Mm-hmm. I think you know, as far as the safety, you know, there's been a lot of bad accidents. You know, you lose the brakes. Uh, there's not a whole lot to go, uh, and it looks like a ramp with the bank with the with the banking that they mm-hmm. had. Um, I like to play. You know, how would would it still have two dates today on the NASCAR schedule? Probably not. I would like to think, cross my fingers here. I would be like, let's go to Sonoma and Riverside. I think it would end. The, I think it would end the the, the 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 championship. I would think Cup would end there. Oh yeah. I, I, I don't think it would start there, but I definitely no. think. Imagine Riverside today, as the like like completely imagine if Riverside was the last race of the playoffs. That'd be great. You have four drivers now. You have to. The four, those four drivers have to be road course experts, basically. You can't just... I mean, you guys, they probably all won on ovals. The whole... Most of the chase leading up to that... We wouldn't even need the Roval at that point. But I, I would hope that we would still have the Roval, because yeah. the Roval's really kind of cool. Yeah, we um, can admit that now after watching it. No, I, st- I thought the Roval yeah. was cool originally, because the thing about the Roval is it actually has a lot of elevation changes mm-hmm. that I didn't know were there. Mm-hmm. So it actually makes... So actually, the layout of the Roval and the combined with the elevation changes makes it a very challenging racetrack, mm-hmm. uh, not just on the drivers but on the cars and the teams and everything like that. So I mean, you, you're because you're preparing a car that's essentially going to drive up and down elevation changes, and then all of a sudden going to go into the banking and then into a bus stop on the back stretch. It's crazy. But Riverside was kind of like that too, where you have uphill, you know, S's and very then a downhill. Oh, just so. So beautiful. You know, the sad part is too is you know what's sad is when you mention that it was it's a part of the land is now a mall, and the thing about it is is obviously you can imagine most malls nowadays in the United States are not doing very well, and that mall apparently hasn't been doing very well for a while now. So it's almost as if Riverside now is being lost in vain. I would be more happy if the mall itself was more successful and prosperous, but to see the mall. You know, having some severe downturn like that. It it's was just, late to the game with the yeah. mall, with the whole mall changing suburbia uh, culture in America, and you know, being the late '80s. So, yeah, it is disappointing for sure. And it's, there's nothing that remains. Sad. There's nothing that remains no. of this track. I think. Th- I think one of the parking lots you can see some of the. You, you, or one of the parking lots allows you to see some historical relic that's still there. There's a museum down the way that I know has yeah. some. They have historical relics there, but as far as like on the ground, it's, I don't think there's really anything. I know in Ontario, and we'll talk about Ontario another day, part of a banking yeah. still remains. See, because it reminded me, there's a part of Riverside, I think, that reminds me of, and for if anybody ever is interested in old ballparks like I am too, Yes, uh, okay. Atlanta Fulton County Stadium in Atlanta, Georgia, when they tore that down... Um, to make room for the 1996 Olympics, I believe, um, the parking lot to the new complex that they built there is you actually can, like, they built it so that you could see the outfield of what formerly was there. I think, yeah, I think I know what you're talking about. Um, and I think Riverside had something kind of similar to that. And I always thought stuff like that is kind of cool, like, you know, when something's not there anymore, show us where it used to be. Yeah. You know, show us where, where it used to be. So I think about that. Like, imagine parking and saying, man, I'm parking. I'm putting my car right here where so-and-so might have caught a uh, fly ball one time. Mm-hmm. You know, and then you go to Riverside and you could say, okay, wow, I'm literally parking my car where people like A.J. Foyt, Dan Gurney, and Mario Andretti, and, and guys like that, and Rusty Wallace, Dale Earnhardt, you know, 
they ran here. Mm-hmm. Richard Petty ran here. You yep. know, pe- big, huge names like that. It's so sad to see it, you know, not exist anymore. But and the what ifs too with this auto club get built kind of deal. Oh, I don't care. So. When, when you get if Ontario and Riverside are still here, yeah. auto club does not get built. No, no doubt about you that. You don't need they're all right auto there. Auto club because you just yeah. have Ontario and Ontario yeah. was. Ontario was trying to one up Riverside, trying to host a Formula One event Grand Prix anyway. Yeah, it was. It, it's definitely a huge loss. Um, I, you know, I, it's definitely one of those tracks that when I first found out about it, when I was younger. I'm like, I kind of fantasized about it, and, mm-hmm. and you're like, man, this is just so cool. It's definitely if I were to, if it's not on your fantasy schedule, like all time fantasy yeah, schedule, absolutely, you're you're doing something wrong. They used to air my favorite thing was ESPN Classic yes. when they were around. Used to air old NASCAR races yes. from time to time, and they used to air. I think they aired the 1988 Budweiser 400. I think I've watched. I watched the um, 86 race where where Richmond yeah. where Richmond won that one the season finale. I race. know I have the final one. Some from the ESPN Classic version, like on a VHS tape somewhere. Like I taped it. Like I, I Smart found out move. it was going to happen, and I taped it because it was it was cool to me at the time. I was like, man, when am I ever going to get to watch another race at Riverside again? Yeah. Um. So yeah, Riverside, a beautiful, beautiful track that One more note sadly on is too. no longer. One more note. Someone tried to rebuild it. Someone did try. Unfortunately, it it it, it failed. Um. But maybe one day. Yeah, one maybe, day maybe if one if day. I if I ever come into enough money, <laughs> like if I strike oil or something in the next like start digging. Yeah, I, I'm one of my fantasies is to buy a gigantic like plot of land in California, like probably a a, a fa- failing mall. You yeah, know, assuming <laughs> ideally a failing mall. Uh, I buy it, bulldoze the thing to the ground, and. Uh, Recreate both Ontario and Riverside and call it the California Motorsports Park. There you go. And have them both be not necessarily next, right next to each other, but in the same vicinity. There you go. That's that's smart. That's, that's, that's a dream, a fantasy of mine, of something that I would definitely one hundred percent do. And 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 build build them to their exact same the exact specifications. same specifications. Yeah. I want that Ontario infield road course to happen, and I need the Ontario. Uh, front stretch to be the exact same because I still think that's yeah. the most picturesque. It was very picturesque. I mean, it, I mean, Indianapolis it is time. beautiful, and I think Indianapolis is picturesque. But Ontario is on a different level of picturesque. Not maybe as high, but definitely as like memorable and as beautiful and as pretty. Yeah. Um, just something like that. That that's that's my goal. Uh, it never will happen unless you know a very rich person wants to donate to to this cause. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, so we're going to move on uh, now after talking about uh, Riverside for, for a while. We're going to use the last 10 minutes of the show to talk about what's in the windshield. So we've got uh, in the windshield this upcoming weekend, we've got the Formula One French Grand Prix, which is at Circuit Paul Ricard for the, uh, for the second year in a row. The race returned last season after a nine-year absence, and Lewis Hamilton bested for Max Verstappen last year. Uh, the race overall was more or less pretty entertaining from my standpoint. However, tire deg, again, was not a factor. No. Um, and I think hopefully Pirelli will bring a less durable tire, but I'm not counting counting on it. I think a lot of guys, nobody will take the softs. I think everybody will probably start on medium tires uh, and probably make it on two stops, which is probably what will end up happening. And I'm sure, based on the way that the, the circuit is, if somebody decides to, you know, take a gamble, start the race on hard tires, and only make one stop, that could happen too. Um, Paul Ricard is a great track that definitely is not the most well looking. No, it's 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 not aesthetically pleasing. It's really not. It's definitely not. It's too it's too busy. It's but too you want to know what is aesthetically pleasing? IndyCar this weekend is at Road America. Yeah, which is probably one of the most prettiest road road uh, road courses in the United States. And uh, it is uh, on June 23rd, the Rev Group Grand Prix at Road America. Since Road America's return in 2016, Will Power, Scott Dixon, and Joseph Newgarden has been the three winners. However, Sebastian Bourdais is the only other winner in the field as he won the final champ car race there in 2007. And Penske has been strong here, going 2, 3, 4, and 5 in 2017 with Newgarden, Elios, Pagano, and Power. Uh, so I always love Road America. I think it's going to be a great race. I actually believe Alexander Rossi will probably drive through the field like he has the last couple of years. Um, I think he'll probably pull it off if I'm going to, you know, start making 
predictions. I yeah. mean, Formula One's easy to predict because probably Hamilton will win it, barring some kind of catastrophe. Mm-hmm. But uh, for IndyCar, I think uh, that's it's time for Alexander Rossi. I don't know. How about you? What do you think? Yeah, uh, you know, when I'm looking at, you know, Penske's kind of tough to not go against, but I'm going to keep riding the Alexander Rossi. He's going to win one of these days, right? We're not, we don't, we don't have a, a game here where we can only pick one uh, driver one time. Mm-hmm. I'm going to keep riding this Alexander Rossi thing you know, until like he wins. You. Why not? Yeah, keep I going mean, with it. But he's so good. I mean, he is so good, and he's very good at this track as yeah. well. Yeah, uh, I think this track is going to be a lot of fun. Uh, it's always one of the more fun tracks. It's four mile track. So, uh, and then uh, next week as well, we've got. Uh, the Monster Energy NASCAR Cup Series at Sonoma Raceway again on June 23rd, and the Toyota Save Mart 350, and the Carousel Returns, which for some reason I don't care for, but everybody else does. Everybody else thinks the Carousel is cool. I always love that shot of those cars coming off the corner there where they get into that big runoff area, mm-hmm. and they come right in front of the camera. That's like my favorite shot. That's a, that's a shot. And, I'm, and, and, and everybody's freaking out like Carousel is from... But, but that shot is gone, and I'm not going to get over it. Yeah. I'm not going to get over it, so... I mean, yay, the carousel's back for the drivers, I guess. But for me as a fan, I like the other layout a little bit more. I thought it was... I mean, you see three-wide passing going into there. You see guys, like, breaking super late just to get in there. And then they can use all that runoff area. And then try not to hit the wall right when it, like, squeezes oh, yeah. out. They just... Each year, I feel like they just inch closer I closer wanted someone... I, I keep waiting, like, when is someone going to hit this wall? They just no, never had the camera. No one ever has... And now we, we lose that for the carousel, which, you know, for some fans is great, and I'm sure for you is probably great too, but, you know, for me is kind of a guy who really liked that aspect of Sonoma. I, it is, I, I'll I'm say that's what I'm going to I will miss that aspect, but I don't know. Like, this, I think it's more of a nostalgia thing uh, more than anything for so many fans with the carousel returning because we haven't run it since... The 90s. 97, I believe. And right, well, I mean, I was two in 97, so there's no nostalgia for me. Well, <laughs> just the, the older fan, and the, people who watch the old races, and you remember there's been some fantastic, if you can have a fantastic wreck, there's been some, uh, you know, just call it fantastic wrecks. People who have wrecked there on the carousel, and I think those are kind of, you know, the more memorable accidents on road courses have happened in the carousel and, and in NASCAR. Um and I don't know. It, it will be interesting to see because no one has raced on this circuit. Uh, yeah, you're right. Because there's like I mean, nobody. Unless you have like Derek Cope starting this race, which I don't think he is. You're not going to have anyone who's been on the carousel. So this is going to be new for everyone. Will there be any like road? Cor- I don't think we need. We have any road course ringers. Road anymore, course ringers we? haven't been effective for a number of years. I don't think you're going to see one there. I miss when Scott Pruitt and Boris said, "Yeah, would qualify like one and two, and then whip everyone, but never win." They'd always get beat by someone else. Something happened. Because, like, their pit crew was just, like, this... They didn't have the best... Yeah, they had this, like, cheap cheap pit crew. Not, I should say cheap, but, like, this inexperienced pit crew that someone just kind of threw together. Yeah. And they'd never... But but they were always fast. They were always really fast, so... Um, And there's another... and, and, And it should be noted... That this is the final Fox Sports broadcast of 2019 season, and this is Daryl Waltrip's final NASCAR broadcast, which is crazy to think about, yeah. because I feel like Daryl Waltrip's been doing this for... I mean, I remember when Daryl Waltrip first got in there, because I remember listening to Mike Joy, Buddy Baker, and uh, Ned Jarrett when I was a kid, but then when Daryl Waltrip got in there, that's when I got really excited for NASCAR every day. Boogity, boogity, boogity. It's going to be real hard not to hear that next yeah. year. Um, you could people could say what they want want to say about Daryl, but man, I'm gonna miss him a lot. So, uh, but uh, it'd be one of those things where you you'll miss it when it's gone. Oh, and absolutely. It, you, know, you, you won't know what you have until it's gone. Um, I mean, again, say what you want about you know the broadcast in recent years. I think uh, you know just some things were brought to light when they brought Gordon into the booth, and yeah. and you know. But even then, they shouldn't have split up the. The golden trio of Larry, uh, of Larry, Mike, and Daryl. Because I mean, those guys were now, what's legendary. The point of, well, what's the point of bringing Gordon in if you were if you were gonna? I don't even think they needed to bring Gordon in. He could have just yeah. been a studio analyst, and it would have been fine. But I, speaking of studio analysts, I think Jamie McMurray might be the guy who steps into that. No, nah, they gotta give. Yeah, I gotta give Larry Mack his booth roll back. Well, we'll see. They spent all that money on that on that nice studio in Charlotte. We'll... Oh, just give bring it bring it with him. I don't know. I don't, I'm being flippant now. Anyway, the NASCAR Gander Outdoors Truck Series races a worldwide technology raceway at Gateway. Why do we call it that? Just call, I'm calling it Gateway. 
So the Gateway 200 official, official title. I know. They pay, Worldwide Technology paid a lot of money. I'm not for calling them. Phoenix ISM. They can call it ISM all they want, but it's Phoenix, and it's always going to be. I, I don't care if they change the whole configuration of that track. It's Phoenix. I'm sorry. Uh, anyway, the entry li entry list has not been released, but uh, there's not a previous winner in the field for Saturday's race at the current moment. Uh, and the question will be: How does Ross Chastain and Nice Motorsports respond to their penalty if it is not, uh, if their appeal is not uh, upheld? Well, it's just either way, you know. Either way, if I don't think they're going to win the appeal, but let's play the hypothetical game because we're not we're not above that. Um, even if they were to win the appeal, they still want to go out and show: Look, we can win a race without being DQ'd and having to get it back. Um, and, and I think, again, as I mentioned before, I think Ross is a guy who can, who can put up with that mental aspect of coming back from a setback. Mm -hmm. saying it's too saying it's too but yeah, it's came back from the from setback, um, as he's done many times before, and I have no doubt they'll get another one. So, see how they do in Gateway. Yes, we will. We will see how they do in Gateway. Anyway, that is all for our podcast for today, everyone. Be sure to tune in next week when we talk about racing from Road America, Soma, France, so Sonoma, France, and Gateway, and the action that comes out of those races. Again, we want to reiterate that you should indeed be following us both on Twitter at R-O-L-L-E-R underscore zero one and at R-P-E-E-T-E-R-S three three. Josh and I hope you enjoyed today's podcast, and we will hope you in will tune in next week. Thank you for all your support, and we hope you join us next time. For Josh Roller, I'm Rob Peters. This was the Racing with Robin Roller podcast. Have a great week, everyone.